Hi everyone, thanks for checking out the new video. Uh, so this is part two of my um, series in uh, building an RPG from scratch. Um, so yeah, last video we went over a little bit of the prelude stuff. Um, I showed you what assets I'll be using uh, for this. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, it says from scratch. Um, I'm not really a 3D model up, but uh, yeah, this is pretty much putting all the assets together and building an RPG from, um, yeah, pretty much nothing. Uh, anyway, um, the update for from the last video there, uh, Invector actually brought out a new patch. Uh, previously I was using 1.12 uh, and now it's actually 1.1.3 I believe. Um, the only, it, it hasn't actually, um, so we can go to release notes, bring that up, just confirm that that's the patch number. Ah, whatever, it's the patch number anyway. Um, okay, so 1.13. <laughs> um, it's brought out a couple of cool updates. Um, it includes the hip fire ability, so now you can actually shoot without having to aim down sights. Um, previously, you had to aim um, as part of the shooter. Uh, this time, yeah, you can actually fire from the hip, and it's also introduced as well um, a little option that I um, I'd suggested, and it's uh, really cool that they've put that in, is uh, adjusting the accuracy of fire. Um, based on being aimed down sights and uh, hip fired, so you can actually set um, the displacement of rounds um, due to how it's aiming. Um, not super big for an RPG, but uh, if you are trying to make like a third person shooter, um, especially with uh, games like uh, Player Unknowns and stuff like that and so forth, um, it is really helpful for that because you can actually give people a reason to have to aim down sights. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's just some of the new update. Uh, when I dragged it in though, it did cause a couple of errors. The only error it actually caused um, with that was with the quest add-on. Um, so if we go into here, we've got the quest manager. Um, all it did was it actually overwrote the item enums, uh, which we had uh, we have to change when we put on the, the quest option. So it hasn't actually uh, messed up the thing. The, the quest manager still works with um, uh, with the new version, it's just that you have to redo the item enums. I do have a video on that, but I'll just quickly go over it. Uh, if we come up to here, we got uh, inventory, item enums, open item enums uh, editor. So what I did is it actually just overwrote the enums list that we'd uh, edited previously. Um, so just make sure that you go back into here under V item enums list. Uh, you go down here, item attributes, change that from four to six, and then put in buy price from vendor and sell price to vendor. And then uh, all those errors went away and everything was uh, back to normal, which is great. Um, so yeah, so other than that, uh, I don't have any of the game documents here. I'm actually going to do up a little performer um, based on what I was talking about uh, last uh, last video about um, producing your documents, uh, going over game mechanics and, and sort of trying to finalise exactly what your idea is. I might just put up a performer um, uh, available to download from Google Docs where uh, it just helps you along so you can you can list down what your game mechanics are, maybe a little bit about your story, maybe a little bit about the characters, just so you can sort of... You, you, I, you can look at it and get prompted to, to come up with some ideas that might help you along with your um, your game development, um, so your, your pre-planning, everything like that. Um, one of the things that I do have for today though, I actually stumbled on this resource earlier when I was uh, thinking about how to um, start doing some of the creative side of the, the game planning. So I'll just bring it up here. Um, I actually looked up for a, just a random fantasy map generator. I just typed in fantasy map generator in Google and this was the first one to come up. I think it's called Asgar's Block. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. I was able to do a few things. So you can just click random map and it will come up with a bunch of names um, and yeah, just a little layout that you can do. You can change the style of it so you can change um, how it looks. Uh, in the yeah, in the style menu you can put it in grayscale. Um, yeah, it seems every time I do it, it seems to actually throw out everything. Otherwise you can have it in the uh, the old fantasy style of sepia tone. So I've actually done this one here. Um, now what I've used that for is uh, I, can, I can actually save that image and I probably will save um, that so I can't uh, so you can actually save it as an SVG file and that um, yeah basically you can open that up in your web browser and uh, access it anytime. Just going to save. Uh, oh, won't let me save it as an image. Well, anyway, this is what it looks like. Um, I'll go back to it later and I'll figure it out. Um, I've used the names for this to to sort of prompt a little bit of a story. Now I've already known the, the story from a main character. It's actually the one I'm going to be using in um, in the the proper RPG that I make. Um, that's one that I've been using for a few of the demos that I've made previous. Um, I'll just bring up the story here. So it's called Zamon's Quest. Um, that's just the name of my little apprentice sorcerer that I've had as the the basis for the story. Um, 
uh, all the stories that I've been doing as a, a part of a series. So uh, as I've got here, so he finds himself travelling through Tellia, um, which if we go back to here, we realise that's this place down here, uh, on his way to study in the ancient tower of Magi in Nalesia. So if we come back up, and that's this one just up the top here. So the idea, I've just basically picked those two locations um, when they had that in the colour one, you can see that this one here was a weird sort of bluey green colour, made it look more like it was a magical forest area, but you can pretty much put anything. These, these are just sort of to, to prompt you um, when you're coming up with creative ideas, when, when you get these names sorted out, I find that that's that's one thing that really helps me with creative stuff because I always get stuck trying to figure out a name that doesn't sound generic and then doesn't also sound a little bit too fantasy style or, or, or am I just drawing or is it a copy of something else? Is it too too much towards the, the fantasy and that just makes it sound like I'm just trying to get tongue-tied and, and pull in you know, words out of the air, which technically I have done using a random generator, but at least I can, don't have to feel guilty about it because someone else came up with it, so that's fine. Anyway... Um, so yeah, I've just put it in, so uh, I've got those things that I thought, oh, what would an apprentice sorcerer be doing? Well, he'd be travelling because I want him to sort of, you know, get from one place to another. Um, where would he be travelling to? Well, the Tower of Magi because he wants to complete his training as a sorcerer. Uh, so he hopes to un uh, unlock the next tier of his training there under careful tuition from the great warrior mage El Toth. So that was, a, that was a name I made up myself. And I don't know, I've watched a little bit too much of um, Conan the Barbarian cartoons, or Conan the Adventurer, should I say. Um, so I've got a lot of that uh, real Alamon and El Toth and that in my head when I think of, you know, warrior mages and, and um, basically Stygians. Uh, anyway, um, Zaman has travelled uh, the roads of Telly before because I wanted to sort of give it a little bit of context of, um, you know, he's obviously travelled uh, enough uh, being a sorcerer, he's, he's sort of travelled around to learn to get to where he is. Um, but then I needed to actually add in something there that made a, a reason for why he would stop in this area and you know, start the quest, basically. Um, so I've come up with this, looking at the map again, I've noticed, you know, who's on the border here. Um, you can't quite tell, maybe from this image, but there's actually mountain ranges uh, in between uh, Kiglon and Telia, and uh, they basically join up on a border that crosses over the mountains. The same as uh, these, uh, Morwedia and Latuthia. Uh, Latuthia? I don't know how you pronounce that, but I'm just going to call it Latuthia. So there you go. My game will have Latuthia. Remember that. Um, in case I start calling it something else later. Uh, so I thought that, you know, maybe there was, um, uh, you know, like a, a, some sort of border dispute. I thought, oh, just a border dispute over a mountains. Nobody's really going to be pushing the boundaries of the mountains. I mean, if they are, it's really pointless. So I give it a little bit more context, and I've come up with um, recent disputes of claims in the central mountains have seen tensions rise with the neighbouring nation of Kinglon, home to the industrious dwarven race. So my idea is that there's going to be mines and um, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, rare material or, or something of... Um, of you know, note in those uh, in those mountain ranges there that um, everyone wants a piece of. So the dwarves are a mining race. They're obviously going to go through, and they're going to have a bit of issue with the uh, the kingdom of Telia. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, neighbouring nations. So it's a nation of Kiglon and a kingdom of Telia. Um, so. Yeah, they're, they're going to have a little bit of back and forth, which sort of um, has a bit of instability in the region, and that's flowing onto the rest of Talia because they're obviously having a hard time trying to get this um, uh, this product of, of wealth, so this um, this sort of income that they need. Uh, the dwarves are obviously taking over that um, and pushing them out, so it's causing a little bit of financial crisis in there, um, which has led to groups of bandits uh, that now find a camp along some of the remote areas. So their bandits are preying on some of the more remote areas where there's less of the uh, the Italian soldiers to, to manage it. Um, and then dukes and their brigands, so obviously the dukedom, um, so like all the, the dukes that live around the area that support the king, they've got their own forces. I'm just calling them brigands for now because um, I wanted to throw brigands in there but make them a little bit different from just plain old bandits. Um, and then, of course, they're capitalising on the chaos by imposing harsh rule over peaceful farmers. So just trying to set the scene of, like, you know, there's a bit of turmoil in the, the area that he's travelling through um, so that this way I can lead into more stories about why he's stopping along the way to where he wants to go to. Um, and then I've made a little bit uh, more fleshing out of the character. So I said, Zaman's not one to shy away from heroics, but he knows that as an apprentice, his magics are not enough to bring about peace to a whole kingdom. So showing that he's actually... Yeah, he's cool, he's got some really cool abilities and that, but of course he needs something to progress. Um, one of the big things with an RPG and, and a lot of RPGs that I find, especially MMOs, is that they tout you as like the one special person to, to do this with your ultimate power, but then of course you go out and play and you're getting killed by a level one rabbit, so it's not really, it doesn't quite translate. So obviously you need, um, you need 
uh, an arc for a, a character to go along. So you want him obviously to start off as though, you know, yeah, he's got the talent and everything like that, but he needs to, you know, refine it and pour it into something so he can grow in power and become good enough to do stuff. Um, so that's just sort of why I've thrown that in there. Um, that's just to sort of explain that away. Uh, anyway, so uh, then I've tried to actually set the scene for what I'm going to start out as the, um, sorry, what I'm going to set up as the, the starting scene. Um, so I got here, Zama ponders such concerns as his cart reaches the town of Elurial. Again, I've just made up a name. I'm not really super happy with it, but I'm never happy with the names that I come up with. Anyway, um, the darkness of night nears and the driver motions to a nearby tavern. My lord, night falls soon and my mule and I will need to rest for tomorrow's journey. Um, very generic line of a uh, no name, whatever, but this is just a, an example build RPG, so um, don't judge me. Uh, Zamo just nods uh, in acceptance. Um, see, this this is actually something I sort of thought of um, actually a little bit uh, when I was writing it. So when you're doing RPGs, um, if you've got a story and things like that, normally you'd go like, oh, my character wants to say this now. And then you've got um, the other aspect of that where the characters don't actually say anything. So I think of The Legend of Zelda games where you know Link never actually replies with anything. It's everyone else who's talking and then he just stays silent and that is enough of an answer in itself. So, because I don't really want to put in a little bit of text from Zamon or for his character, um, I've just left it as that for now. I might change it later. He might have lines in it. I don't really know how I want to go with that just yet. But for now, just for a little bit of fluff, this is good enough. Um, so, yeah, it says that the driver already starts to manoeuvre towards the stables. The cart comes to a stop and Zamon dismounts. Peering back over to the tavern, he sees the signboard, Old Chester's Rest. So that's just a little setup for the demo scene. So yeah, the idea there is that um, the game will start and you're actually not on the, um, the the cart anymore, so you're standing at the front of the cart and you can see um, Old Chester's Rest on the signboard, so that'll be like an indication to your first um, first quest goal, basically, of, of going to into the inn and, um, oh, sorry, into the tavern and uh, yeah, signing up for rest for the night. Anyway, so that's what I've got so far for that. Um, it's nothing super fancy, but it's just an example of, of how you can start out by um, trying to kickstart your uh, your idea for uh, for your story and how to sort of just come up with some basic points and what to, to sort of look at, how to get these little reference points. And from that, just using your imagination to, to sort of push through there. Um, a lot easier for you if you if you know a bit about creative writing. Um, you, I mean, if you do know about creative writing, you've probably got your own processes anyway. Um, but if you don't, it's just a couple of handy little tips that you can use. So again, um, yeah, I'm horrible with names, but you can use random generators um, like I've done here with the map. I've used that to help get names and from that spawn an idea about what I want to um, have happen to the character. So anyway, we'll jump back into here. Now for um, this, uh, so for this video, um, probably not going to get too deep into using the, um, the quest tool just yet, but I will get into trying to set up a, um, a player character, or even just the basic player character that we can get for now. Um, as we go along, that player character is going to have to change um, either, I wouldn't say dramatically, but um, it will have to change with little bits and pieces that we throw on top when we um, start mixing in some of the other subsystems um, and like the, the quest system itself. But for now, I just want to actually try and get a character that can um, run around in an area, maybe play with a little bit of weapons, um, and yeah, climb up on obstacles and just start doing that. So to do that, I'm actually not going to create the world just yet. Uh, I'm going to create just a little demonstration area, so just a small square um, terrain piece, and then we're going to throw objects on top of that to interact with. Um, we'll get into throwing in some weapons um, and some items, and uh, yeah, maybe if we have a little bit of time at the end, um, we'll start getting into putting in uh, some enemies. Anyway, so the way that we start doing this is, so we've got our blank scene um, that's kind of just got a main character, uh, sorry, main, main camera and a directional light. I'm just going to uh, either right click and go to 3D object, or I believe you can click on this, go game object, or you can click on create game object, and again we're going to go 3D object and terrain. So as you can see, this will pop up a terrain. Uh, oh, I'm on the game monitor screen. Let me jump to the scene screen. So as you can see, it's at point zero zero. Has put the corner of the um, thing. So basically, the pivot point of the terrain, um, technically. Um, we're going to come across here. As we can see, uh, if we go to the options thing, the terrain settings, um, you can see the terrain is. Do, 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 do. Uh, here we go, terrain width, terrain length is 500 by 500. So as you can see the zero point, um, when we click on 
this here, we can see the zero pointing is right in the corner. So that's zero, zero in the game's 3D space. Um, a lot of things that you're going to deal with are all going to pop up at zero, zero. If you, if you have it prefab and you drop it in here, um, it'll come up at zero, zero because that's just the, the base thing. What happens if you start putting in offsets along here and then you apply them and put them in as a prefab, those, uh, those offsets will get saved. And then if you try and spawn them in later in the game, they may or may not pop up in places that you don't want them to because they're trying to read they'll spawn at zero zero but then add um sorry i'm pointing with my finger here then they'll add uh the position data that they've got in here and so of course so you'll want it to spawn in this location here but it might spawn over here so one of the things that i like to do is actually make zero zero the center of the game space that i'm working on so obviously the corner of the terrain that we've got not going to be good enough um, the way to move that is now that we've got the the terrain highlighted we come to the transform and we type in negative 250 in the X and then negative 250 in the Z axis. So what that does is now when we, uh, well we can't really click on a zero point because there's nothing there, but if we go to um, create a 3D object and we're just going to put um, cube, you can see the cube spawns at, for some reason, negative one, but if we zero that out, zero, zero, Zero. Sorry, so my computer's lagging a little bit. I think it's to do with the um, the lighting that's popping up. So I'm just going to close some of these programs. I'll even actually close down Steam. Just make sure nothing else is running. Discord. I'm going to quit out of that. I do actually have a Discord channel too. Um, I do normally, or I was planning on doing this as a sort of a Twitter. Uh, sorry, not a Twitter. A um, Twitch feed or a Twitch stream so that you could uh, have some live context. Um, unfortunately, I'm just running off a single monitor at the moment, so it's not really. Um, feasible to start running it through Twitch. Um, it's just a little bit annoying to, to handle having to do that on a single monitor. Um, so I'm just doing these up as videos at the moment. But if you do have any questions, jump on the forums, jump on um, the, the Discord. Uh, you should be able to find a link to that. I'll have a link in the description anyway for that. Um, yeah, ask me the questions there. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the other stuff that I do, just comment on the videos or on the forums and um, I'll try and help out. Anyway, uh, moving back on, so now you can see that our cube is at zero, zero, and you can see it's in the center of the map. If I move around, you can't really see as far as the eye can see due to the light settings on the scene, which I'm actually going to turn down because I don't quite like how that comes out. Um, yeah, so this is going to be the basic scene. I'm just going to delete that cube. Um, so now I've got uh, uh, basically enough room to run around um, at about 250 uh, units in either direction. I think the units sort of equate to meters in unity as far as I'm aware. Um, the reason I put it as negative 250 by negative 250 is again, I'll point out in the options menu, it's 500 by 500. So the center of that terrain would be 250. Um, but of course we want it to move from the zero point 250 into the center so we go negative in each direction and it will pull that back and now we get the zero um, center which is good anyway um moving on from that so now we've got the terrain uh one good thing to do especially if you're going to be playing with brighter sessions um things like that is you want to add in some textures so i'm just going to go edit textures i'm going to go add texture and we're just going to find one uh, obviously i've imported i've got a lot of different graphical pieces um but I want to get something that's sort of like a grid, because again, this is going to be, um, yeah, see, I've got a little brick normal up there that I can use. Um, yeah, again, this is just going to be a test area, so if I implement a new game mechanic, I want to be able to test it out. I don't have to actually have a full-blown map um, that's just going to end up trying to, you know, eat up a lot of um, everything else and, and get a little bit distracting. I just want an area that's pretty much blank with very basic um, stuff set up, just so I can test out some of the, the usual stuff. So we'll come up here, we've got the proto white um, section, I'm just going to double click that. So that's what that's going to be, size 15, we're actually going to bring that down to say 3 by 3, that's the usual number I have, uh, that sort of makes it a bit weird, um, let's go to 5 by 5, and then apply. So there you go, that's a little bit better, Could probably put it as 1 by 1, doesn't really matter. Um, but that just means that yeah, when the character's running around, instead of having a fully white reflective um, uh, bottom. Yeah, apologies for that. So I had someone at the door. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so as I was saying, um, yeah, when you adjust the light level on here, um, it'll go all super bright and all that sort of stuff. So just to, to make it a bit easier on the eye as I'm playing around, I'm just going to set that to 0.5. Um, also like it being proper white instead of crazy orange sunlight. Um, so yeah, as you can see now, it's a little bit clearer as we're running along. And if we go into game mode, yeah, you can see, even though far out it does actually um, 
get very reflective. That's to do with the uh, yeah the lighting systems and the yeah, the hurry and the what's it. We'll go over that later. Anyway, um, so now we've got our basic platform to run around on. Uh, the terrain is set to the default layer um, and it's set to static for all the navigation purposes. So now we want to get our character um, and we want to get that ready to go. Uh, most uh, most of the time you can actually just put through any kind of humanoid character that's got the, the humanoid skeleton um, and that'll be perfectly fine. It just automatically um, gets assigned to what uh, what it needs to be through the wizard. Um, just one second. Sorry, just talking so much, I got a little bit thirsty. Um, <coughs> Well, one thing that you do need to look out for, I found with a, a couple of times, if um, the prefab that you're actually using to create your character, if it is a prefab and not just a, um, a basic mesh or model that you're you're importing, um, you can have a little bit of issue with, uh, you know, it might have a collider already on it, it might have a few other little um, components on there that will uh, either conflict or just not be useful and just cause a little bit of extra mess on the um, the character once it's built. So I'm um, using, as I said the other day, I discovered um, the Polygon Fantasy characters which look pretty awesome. Uh, so I'm going to go use those. When you click on the prefabs, um, you'll see just in the bottom corner here, I'll just bring this up so we can see it a little bit better. We've got all sorts of little characters that come through from here and they all look pretty cool. Um, we've got the female gypsies, we've got the druid, uh, we've got the peasant here which is pretty cool and then a second type of peasant which is also cool and then a change there for a queen which is actually that's a really nice one um, then we've got a witch which is great too so that it's actually a really cool character I like the, um, the skirt design and then the the bed um, bed I think it's supposed to be a bard but that's all right um, so yeah this guy is actually pretty cool I was originally going to use him but um, yeah, I think for a sorcerer character, I need more of a, a sorcerer model. This one here, I might have as a sidekick uh, at some stage. I am a big fan of the Witcher, so we've got Dandelion. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then, of course, we've got a king. Uh, this pack also comes with male peasants, um, a male rouge, or a rogue, as it's supposed to be. Um, yeah. And then we've got the male sorcerer. This will be the model that I'm actually going to use as the player character. And then we've also got a, a wizard, so your standard um, wizard character. Also comes with a few other bits and pieces, so you've got all sorts of um, props and that to use. I uh, quite like the look of the wizard stuff. That's pretty cool. I'll probably be um, showing you that today, how to turn that into a shooter weapon. Um, hopefully I can get around to that within the hour. Uh, so yeah, this will be the character that we're using now. If we go to bring this back down, so you can see that this um, character has the prefab model. It uh, just has the animator and the transform on it. Sometimes you might have, there might be like a, um, a mesh collider on here or even just a, a basic capsule collider. You don't want any of that there um, before you put it into the wizard. You just want to have the animator and the, the transform. And then of course uh, when we open it up you can see it's got uh, all the other parts. So um, the material, all that sort of stuff. So we go, yep, that's all good to go. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so then we'll click back on this. We'll close this up. Now we need to make the controller. So for the RPG that I'm going to be making, uh, it's going to be using um, both uh, so melee weapons or melee weapons, um, but it's also going to be using some of the shooter weapons because I want to have magic spells, I want to have um, staffs that fire, and I actually want to use a little bit of the guns as well. Um, these adventure kits and a few of the, the pirate ones, and that, they come with low poly guns. So it's not that it can't be in a fantasy world, they're usually the blunderbuss or like the very old um, flintlock style weapons. So they, they do fit into the, the area, uh, uh, sorry, into the design. And of course, if you're doing a more modern or a futuristic game, you want to have the guns anyway. So I'm actually going to create a shooter controller. So I'm going to go in vector uh, shooter and then create shooter controller. So now it pops up with this thing here. This is the um, the wizard, uh, the, so the character creation wizard, should I say? Or uh, actually, I won't call it character creation wizard because um, doing an RPG, obviously, that can get a little bit confusing with the character. But this is um, so the the third person controller wizard, basically. So this helps me set up the main player um, and gives it all the options it needs in order to move around and, and control a um, 3D model in space, um, representative of the player. So I'm just going to click and drag this into FBX model. So you can actually use the base FBX model, but I notice with a lot of the ones that I have, um, the FBX model doesn't have any of the material data on it, um, but the prefab does. So I just usually go with the prefab and it's got the animator on it and that's all fine. 
Um, so the animated controller, when you click on that one, now you just click on the little circle with a dot in it, and it's going to bring up the list automatically of the, everything that's available. So there's going to be a whole lot here because um, some of the packs have come with their own um, animator controllers. But the one that we want to have is Invector Shooter Melee or Shooter Melee, however you want to pronounce it. Pretty sure it's Melee, but whatever. Um, you want to click on that one there because that gives us both um, the shooter capability for the, the controller and also the melee capability. If you go sh uh, shooter mobile and shooter only, they're actually different ones. They're set up for obviously being used on mobile and one that's just going to be straight up shooter without any of the melee content. Um, and then of course melee combat just has the melee stuff. It doesn't have any of the shooter um, animations or anything like that put in. And then basic locomotion doesn't have any of the fighting or the combat stuff, just the movement. So we want shooter melee, um, so fairly self-explanatory there, but I explained it anyway. Uh, camera list data. Um, this one here is up to you. There is actually a top-down system. Uh, I was going to make a top-down game, but I'm just having a little bit of issues with trying to get the uh, control um, the way I like uh, uh, by yeah with, with some of the stuff that I've got. So I'm actually just going to go with a, a full uh, full-blown third-person RPG in this one. So we're going to go with. Um, uh, so you got your basic locomotion, you've got 2.5D which is more for like your um, your side scrollers, that sort of thing. Um, basic locomotion, uh, again that's just for if you're running around so it doesn't do any of the, the zoom in for when you're aiming weapons, anything like that. Um, and it also doesn't have the, the canvas stuff for um, yeah, any of the combat. Uh, the beaten up um, I believe is uh, sort of similar to the, the side scrolling one um, but just in one line rather than uh, the 2.5D where you can actually have it set to animate and go around a course um, that can be like you know in full 3D but you're only looking at it from that angle to give it the 2 5D look. Same as the, the isometric and the, the top down, they're both um, fairly similar. Similar. Um, you can, isometric is the, you can set that angle on it, um, the same as the top down. And now of course moving on from that we're just going to go straight for shooter melee because that matches the controller that we've got. So that allows us to do um, both the, the melee and the, um, the shooter uh, camera angles that we need. So just double click that. And now we've got that and it automatically fills out the, the heads up display. So the HUD controller um, automatically pops up when we've, we've chosen that last one. So you need to know how it works. There's a video tutorial. Clicking on that will take you to YouTube and we'll go through uh, an old tutorial video on, um, on YouTube that uh, has been done by um, Invector. So I can explain to you all these different parts. But anyway, you've just watched me do it, so that's how we do it. Now we've got a little guy. He looks really groovy. I do like the moustache and the, um, the little stripes in the hair, the racing stripes. Um, I am probably actually going to change the colours of this. Um, you can change it too. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, you just need a... Uh, um, any kind of uh, editor for or image editor. I'm using Photoshop. You can use GIMP. Um, there's yeah plenty of other uh, resources out there that are also yeah, that are quite free that you can um, jump in on and, and use. Once we've um, yeah, got all that set up, we're just going to click Create. And any day now, there you go. Now our guy pops in, and of course he pops in at zero zero zero. So like I said, yeah, I wanted him to be central. I didn't want him to be on the corner because if I start the game and he falls backwards, he's going to fall off the map. So it's useless to me. So yeah, start him in the center, and we're just going to hit F to zoom in um, and make him fill the screen. So yeah, you can see now this is our little guy. Um, and in the, the left hand side here in the, um, the hierarchy, we've got the third person cameras being spawned with all the settings it needs. Um, which we've set up as the shooter melee, so it's the third person shooter is what it's targeting, which is our player character. Um, you know, I'm actually going to rename that right now. I'm just going to put um, Samon uh, Prefab 1. So I'm just going to call it that um, because this is going to be our first one. We may end up making a duplicate of it and modifying it um, depending on, on how we want it, but we've always got this backup here that we can use as Xamon Prefab 1. What I'm also going to do with that, in order to make sure that it's saved, I'm actually going to put it in this modified resources folder. Now, um, if you remember from the last video, I've actually set this one up because um, when we modify something from the, the base packages, or especially uh, when we modify something for the Invector package, which is our main template that we're using, um, if I go to update that later, like I've already done um, between uh, the last video and, and now, um, it will overwrite anything that it finds that's different to what's in the new package that you're updating. So if you've actually modified something and it sits in here under a name and it's in that new package, it will go, oh, hang on a minute, that's different to what should be there, so I'm going to overwrite it with this new one. Um, and then you'll lose that work that you've done. So you don't want to do that. So I'm just going to um, click on Modified Resources and I'm actually going to drag that prefab down here. Um, it's not so much of a big issue because it's not going to find um, 
the, the new the new update's not going to actually overwrite my player character um, anywhere, but I do want to have it as a prefab in case I need to pull it into another scene that I'm building on, um, which I will do because this is just going to be a test or a demo scene, um, and then the next one will be the, the proper scene. But I can make all of the modifications into it here and then just click apply and it will apply it to that prefab. So everything that that prefab is in, in any other scene, it will be the same as what I'm doing in this one here. So that, that's a handy way to keep it all simplified. Um, but yeah, but modified resources and then I'm just going to chuck that in there. You can actually go further and like put in a, another folder, which I might actually do. I should do it because it's, it's better practice. I'm just going to put in characters. Um, or actually I'm not even going to put player prefab. And then I'm going to drag that into there. So now I've got it sorted. So in the modified resources, when I go in there, I'm not just looking at a whole mess of things. I'll be able to go, yep, I'm after the player prefab. That's in the player prefab folder. So there it is. Cool. Anyway, um, so we're going to go back here. Uh, so yeah, we've got our character now. We're going to open up um, the third person controller by clicking open properties on the script. And as you can see, we've got the, um, the settings here um, that can help us do a bunch of things. So the default settings, are obviously your, your health, your health recovery, um, stamina. So um, so if your health recovery is like, obviously if you're getting a game where you can get damaged a little bit, but you'll, you'll heal over time, you can set that number in here. Um, otherwise you can just use potions and things like that. Uh, same with the stamina, so stamina recovery. So the stamina grows back over time and you can set what that time is. Health recovery delay, so do you want it to wait a while before it gets it? And then of course current health um, will uh, be adjusted um, when you're actually in playing the game. Now the other death by one, you want to set that up um, as well for, uh, you can either have it as an animation, an animation which then triggers the ragdoll at the end of animation, or uh, just a straight up ragdoll. Um, we will be changing it to maybe animation with a ragdoll or even just ragdoll a um, little bit later on, but we need to actually put the ragdoll on there. Um, and again, remove components after die, so that will um, actually remove some of the stuff after it's dead, but because we're going to be respawning, we're not going to remove anything, we're just going to leave that blank. And then character events is where you can set up um, on certain events that happen, you can have, um, you can just call functions from other areas, things like that. Um, and then of course a debug window, which we might use a bit later on when I'm trying to explain what's going on. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to test out to make sure that it works. So what we need to do is we need to double check that the layers are set up correctly. So we've got the ground layer set to default, um, which is good because uh, if you remember our terrain is on the default layer. So when the uh, controller starts up, it's going to look for layers that it can walk on and it needs to be default. Um, so it, it can tell that the terrain is something that it can walk on. And then the auto crouch layer is also set to default. Um, that's for when you've actually got an auto crouch item that you will force your character into the crouch mode. So if you've got basically um, like a tunnel to go through that you have to crouch to get in, um, you can set it up so that when you when you walk near the tunnel, you will automatically crouch and then crouch all the way through to the end. Um, same with the the head detect. Um, yeah, character auto crouch if something hits the sphere. So yeah, so head detection or auto crouch if it finds something is about to hit it in the head, it will try and duck down. So that's pretty cool. That's something I didn't know existed, but I do now. That's pretty cool. Um, and then the stop move layer. So of course, if you want something to stop the player from moving, so if you've got a wall and you don't like the idea of the player being able to constantly run at the wall and it just looks weird that it's running on the spot, you can have the stop move. So um, if the player comes in contact with that object, it will stop moving in that direction and you can move backwards away from that. Um, and again, stop move height and distance, the same thing. Um, but yeah, so those layers are set up. The main, main point here is um, setting up the ground layer to the right layer, which in this scene is default, so that's fine. Um, next one I want to do is locomotion. Now this is where things get a little bit funny. So originally this was just a root motion controller, so the animations inside had to be root motion in order to propel the character forward. Um, a lot of problem with that is that there's a lot of animation packs out there that aren't root motion. They're actually just um, where your character is animated on the spot. So they'll be running on the spot, uh, in which case you need something else to propel it forward. So they've set up this now so you can actually either use root motion or use the, um, the different walking speeds um, as set by this. So if we've got here free speed, so this is the, the free movement speed, um, and then you've got strafe speed, and that's basically when you're locked onto a target or you're using the strafe option, um, that you can have different speeds set to that. Uh, we're only really going to be using the free speed. I might put in the lock on target um, eventually, but uh, for now we're just going to be using free speed. So we need to um, 
yeah, the, uh, actually, we're, sorry, we're not going to be using this at all, um, but it does affect when you are using root motion, this speed will amplify that root motion itself. So you need to make sure that this is actually put out to the right speed. What I found is setting it to 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, actually sets it up nicely. You can leave the rotation speed at 10, that's fine, um, but everything looks like a, a sort of a normalish speed when you set it to 1.5 um, and it'll do that for the strafe as well in case we do enter strafe mode and put it on there. Um, then you've got roll control, this allows us to um, control our aim or control our um, direction when we're using the roll option um, and then rotate by world turn on spot, um, they do yeah, a little bit of different stuff when you're actually turning the, the character, but for now um, we can leave those blank, we're not going to be looking at those. Um, jump again, I, I've never had to really uh, uh, change anything in the jump section, I usually leave them as they are. And the same as grounded, um, that stuff we'll ignore for now, we don't need to, to worry too much about that. Um, stamina, uh, again, so sprint stamina, this is you can set your actual stamina um, stats here and then uh, once it runs out do you want it to do something maybe it'll play a sound of you're puffed out and then you know maybe it'll trigger off an animation where your character's um, just tired or falls down because he's tired anyway we're not going to do any of that what we want to do now is go here maximize on play so the screen will go full screen I'm just going to hit play and we're just going to test our controller to make sure that he can um, run around on the spot that we need before we go fiddling with him any further so yeah of course first time I'm starting it up so give me a moment There we go, so here's our character, he exists in the world, when we move around his head's looking around, that's because of head tracking, um, he follows the camera, and um, we can turn it off so that he won't keep doing that, I don't really like head tracking myself, but it is, um, there is a cool feature where you can have head tracking on a location, so you run past a big statue, and say you want the character to pay attention to that statue, you can set up a thing so his head will automatically face it, um, and yeah, and then you'll look at that, and that might give the player a bit of a notice to say, hey look at this. So as you can see, we've got our um, we've got our cool little uh, uh, terrain graphic here. So that now it's not just a bright white thing where we can't see whether we're moving or not. We've actually got some context to where we're moving, and now we're moving. And you can see, yeah, the run speed's pretty good. It looks like it's um, falling how it should be. So we're just going to turn around, got to move, got to like this. Um, I'm using the keyboard at the moment. I don't think I have my controller plugged in, but of course, um, with the Invector template, the Xbox controller or the uh, Windows controller works um, seamlessly pretty much, it'll uh, change, it'll automatically detect that you're using it and it'll change up in the top right here. Um, I like to play with that uh, for the most part because it um, does handle very well, especially for third person um, action adventure and even the shooter control is quite nice. Um, yeah, but for now we'll use this. As you can see, if I'm going to left click, nothing's going to happen. I don't, I haven't set up the, um, the fighting stuff on it yet, but for now I can move, I can roll. I can jump, I can uh, control in the air when I'm jumping, I can roll and control which way I'm aiming as I'm rolling. So all that's working fine and we're pretty good. And if I go tab, um, so you see now I'm using the lock on option, so this is the strafe and of course the strafe speed's also correct. So yeah, there we go, I've turned it off. Alright, so that's good, that's working. Um, so now we're going to come back here, we're going to set up the uh, rest of the character now. So we've got the prefab. Um, the first thing that I do when I've made a new controller is I start putting all the different components on it. So this has already got the melee input, um, the shooter stuff, ammo manager, uh, head track again. We're going to leave all that untouched for the moment. We need to make sure everything else is um, put on it before I start making any more changes. So I go up to here, up to the Invector menu. Um, we go to Basic Locomotion because a lot of the uh, components that we want to have are available in the Basic Locomotion pack. So we go to Components and then we've got all these ones here. So the Culling Fade, that's, um, that basically will fade the character out if the camera is about to move into him so that you can see through the head um, when you need to. Um, I'm not going to use that for mine, I'm not uh, going to set it up so there's really any big issues with that. Um, we've got Hit Damage Particle, we are going to want that but the first thing we need to put on um, is the rag doll. Um, the reason for that is that uh, when you start putting on other um, other things, it will start putting on other colliders on here that will affect when the rag doll gets made because the rag doll's done as an automated script. So we click on rag doll, and as you said, it'll pop up with this window. Um, it's got the animator here, which is this one. 
Um, and then it's got a generic character template. We're not using a generic character, we're using a humanoid character. That obviously changes when you have um, something else, uh, like a generic template, which you can choose up here. So if you've got something that's actually not a humanoid um, and you still want to make a ragdoll for it, you can put in the template um, here and it will read that and be able to assign it properly automatically as well. I haven't really played around with that yet, so I'm not too sure, but we might look into that a bit later when we start getting some of the monsters out there. Anyway, as you can see, it's automatically filled everything from the hips um, through to the head, uh, and then it's got enable projection, proportional mass, don't worry about any of that. Total mass, yeah, 20, set it up, that's perfectly fine. Um, and then flip forward, don't worry about any of that other stuff, so we're just going to go create. And as you can see now, you can already start to see some of the ragdoll stuff. So we got the little box around the chest, and then there, there will be a part in the head there. It's just not looking quite as uh, open at the moment. Um, so now we've got here the ragdoll system's been added. So there's the script. Um, remove physics after dying. No, don't worry about that. Disable colliders. Um, that, if you are using the... Um, uh, the horse anim set pro option you need to disable the colliders from the ragdoll system uh, I noticed I had a big issue when I first got it um, I was really really sad because I couldn't figure out what was going on for about three or four days until I realized that um, yeah every time I was trying to mount the horse the horse would get pushed away and then I'd go flying across the map and I couldn't figure out why it's because the colliders were colliding with the ones on the horse um, and that didn't work so you can disable those but for now we're just going to leave it because we don't have to worry about that I'm not going to put horses in um, to this game, or at least I don't think I will. If there is a request, I might put it in uh, as a more of an afterthought um, later on. Anyway, so yeah, so uh, this is the ragdoll system. So that's set up now. So yeah, that's the first thing you want to do, just so that it doesn't really have any um, uh, extra issues with uh, any of the other uh, things that you're putting on. I'm also just going to go here. I'm going to hide these 3D icons. I find that they get in the way quite often. And as you can see now, they did get in the way, because now I can see more of the colliders that I've got for, um, for the ragdoll here. Uh, so in the next component we're going to need to add, we're going to go back to Invector, basic locomotion again, components, and we want to do um, from here, we can actually do hit damage particle, why not, that should be alright. Um, so this allows you to set up um, custom hit effects, so you might have a thing like you want a blood spray, but then of course if you get hit by a firebolt you might want to have flames popping off your character, you can actually set that up through here by going custom hit effects, so if you go 3, that's going to give me three different elements that I can um, put in different uh, particle effects for. And then of course I give them a name. So by doing giving them a name, when you set up the attack on your, um, your NPC or your monster um, in the animated controller, you can name that attack something. And what this does is this looks for the name of the attack that has actually hit the character. And then it goes, oh, okay, every time I get hit with an attack called, you know, Firebolt, I need to spawn this in the place where that Firebolt has hit me. So that will give you, like, you can have a spray effect of, um, you know, uh, embers or whatever that pop off your character or, or things like that. Um, not going to affect that just yet, but we just want it on the character there for um, future reference. Uh, we're going to go back here. We're going to go Vector, Basic Locomotion, Components, and we're going to add in Footstep. So this is the next one we need to add on, and um, this gives us the sound. So this um, used to actually be you'd have to pick which sound you want, but the default has already uh, gone in here, so it's all set up and ready to go. So what this does is it adds little colliders to the foot. Uh, when you're moving around now, you'll see it'll actually make a noise, and it'll also leave little footprints. So I'm going to do that now. I'll actually play and demonstrate that. So you can see I've got little footprints where the foot was supposed to fall. As I run along, it's leaving little footprints, and it should be making a noise, but I've probably got it down a little low, so I'm just going to turn it up. And I'm also not wearing my headphones, so that's probably really loud now. I'm going to turn that back down for you, just in case um, that, that probably won't even affect it. I can't have a look at the audio levels, but anyway, hopefully it's not too loud for you, um, but it's loud enough that you can hear it. So now you can see, yeah, I'm leaving footsteps, and that's just how easy it is to, um, to add the, the footwork in there. Uh, of course, you can set it up so... Um, it runs off different materials. So we've got here custom surfaces. You can add surfaces in there. We just go this. Um, when we click on default surface, you'll see that it already comes with some. It comes with grass, gravel, and metal. So I'm going to put in metal in there. Um, and then when we open that up as an actual item itself, you can see it's got here the textural material names. So if ever the foot collider comes into contact with a texture that's called ladder underscore metal or proto underscore orange, it's going to choose this um, this metal surface as the surface it's on and play the relevant sound which you can put in here. And you can also add in the audio mixer group. So when we go to um, audio, 
um, if I open that up, so I've got audio mixer here, you can see you can actually set the sound levels for each different thing in case your sound is like a lot um, louder than something else, you can always drop the sound down and you just have a bit of control of the audio. Um, I'm not uh, very privy with how all the audio stuff works, I've only really used it um, for this footstep stuff, but uh, yeah, we can have a look at that at a later, um, later on down the track when we start trying to mix a lot of our different audio together. Um, for now anyway, we'll go back to the prefab. So yeah, so that's footstep, footsteps on there now, I'm just going to minimise that. Uh, we go back to Invector, basic locomotion, I'm just going to have a look through here. Um, you've got head track and move set speeds, um, these will help. So head tracks uh, should already actually be on there, so we've already got the head track script there. You've got move set speed, again this is for when you've got things, um, so you've got your own animations, they might not be ragdoll, they might have their own special thing, and you need to adjust the, um, am the amount of speed that the character will move. Uh, when that animation is playing. Um, I'm not going to use that for anything in this game, I don't believe I need to, so I'm going to leave that one out. Um, so we're going to come down here now to actions, and we've got generic action, we've already got one of those in our um, setup, so that's fine, we can leave it as that. Um, gonna, yeah, just minimise those so I can see a little bit more. Um, basically we're motion actions, we're also going to add uh, generic animation, um, so this is for something, so when you're, I think when you're opening doors, or that might be action, I'll we'll have a look at that one later when we, we get to opening doors. Um, but this allows you to do something, so like say you're, you're making a, a thing and you want to press K to do a dance, you can add that in here um, with your action input, um, things like that. So yeah, if you go up to a chair and you want to sit down, you can, you can do stuff like that. Um, just putting it on there, I'm not going to go over it in depth now until we start using it later, um, but it needs to be on there. Um, so the next one as well, ladder action, we want to be able to climb up ladders in this game, so we add the, the ladder action script um, and that's all pretty much set up and ready to go for when you run into a, a ladder and we'll use that as a demonstration a little bit later on. So we, we need that script on there as well. Um, then we come down here, now the next step we need to do is we need to, uh, so we need to start getting all the stuff so we can actually fight and you can have a, an inventory to um, to pick equipment out of. Um, obviously he doesn't have a backpack or anything but he's got a spell book so we just say that the items hide in there. Um, we can also set it up so that he can have items like a sword or whatever sitting on his back. But for now, let's just um, pick this up. So we go basic locomotion, um, uh, sorry we go inventory. Um, now we've got the item play, uh, manager, so player owner, so we need to put that on there. And now it's going to pop up with this window here, the item manager creator window. Now when you click on this, um, it's not going to take you directly to the prefabs that you need to do. Um, so what I like to do is actually like to leave, to leave that window there. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I'm going to navigate in the project folder here. I'm going to go in vector, item manager folder <coughs> and then go to the prefabs. And now we can see we've got a few of these here. Um, I'm going to Extend, no you can't extend, yep, yes we can, excellent. Um, so we want the one, the shooter melee or shooter melee option because remember again we we're using the shooter melee system, <coughs> we need it to be able to figure out um, the different parts. So we use that, that prefab, open it up, we drop it in there and it's obviously um, highlighting the script for shooter melee inventory. Now the item list data, you can click on this one, so we're just going to click on that now and you can see there's several here. We want the shooter melee item list data because that's the one that we're going to be using. So you can double click on that when it works. Um, now, yeah, because we've double clicked on stuff and, and clicked on down here, we've actually lost the, um, the highlighting of the um, character prefab. So we need to click on that again. And you'll see once we move over this window, it says create, click create. And if we scroll down, here we go. The item manager has been added to our player character. Um, so yeah, we've got that on there now. I'm actually just gonna click apply to make sure that everything gets saved to the prefab we're using. Um, so yeah, so we've got this here, the items filter, uh, size 1, we're actually going to change that to 5, I think, consumable, yeah, melee, shooter, ammo, and currency, which is added in with the quest system that we've got. So we have those in there, and that gives us the item list that we need for everything. So we go add item, and now we can start adding all these sorts of things. So we're not going to add anything just yet, we're going to leave it. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, you can just see here, open equip points, so it's already given us the equipment points for um, the left arm and the right arm, and then you can start adding in your own equip points um, after that as well. Close that. Ooh. Attribute events, um, zero at the moment, we are going to have to um, edit that later, uh, as well as events, um, add item, use item, leave item. Um, yeah, we will probably play with this in a later video, but for now, that's fine as it is. I'm just going to minimise that again to save on some space. Going to go back to inventory. Uh, inventory. Uh, we don't need anything more from the inventory list, so we're actually going to go to melee combat now. 
Um, so we've got the controller, NPC, and melee weapon. This is if we're making like a template item or again another player, we're not going to do that. Got to go to components though, and we are going to look for uh, melee manager or melee manager. Uh, open it up, and you can see now this is actually giving us the hitboxes around our um, arms and legs. So that means that we can actually start punching now. It's given us the ability to, to use combat, which is great. So now we can actually um, equip an item and we can also um, punch and attack with that item. Um, so I'll just double check that we can do that now and make sure that that's right. So yeah, we can run along. Uh, we can now right click for blocking and we can left click for punch and kick. Punch and kick. I can jump up and punch. I can crouch down and not punch or do anything. Um, I might look at how to get that doing any later, but anyway, for now, punch, kick, all good. And then if I hit I, you can see it'll pop up with the equipment menu. Um, click on that. Obviously, we don't have any equipment, so that's not going to work for us. And then items will bring us up our entire inventory. And um, we'll change the way that this uh, layout works uh, as we progress along in the RPG, and I figure out, you know, some of the graphics and, and what I want to have it laid out as. But for now, we know that that works, so that's good. Um, so who you can hit, we need to um, check that that property should automatically come up with enemy. So this is for the player to use to hit um, anyone uh, on the enemy layer. Uh, as you can see, our layer is player, but if you go down here, you can also have enemy and companion. Um, so if you wanted to hit anything else, like if you've got, um, say, in the... Um, another layer here for you know breakable doors or breakable um, you know anything. So you just set the layer to breakable. You have to put it in here as another um, another line. So we do that. And we go breakable. So now anything on the layer um, called breakable that has the damage script on it can be damaged by our character hitting it. Um, yeah. So we're going to leave that now as one, and I'll add that in in a later video. But that's just a demonstration of how that works. So now we go back down to here, we're going to go to um, melee combat, we're going to add another component. We've got the weapon holder manager as well, um, so we want to use that. Uh, and that will allow us to do the thing so we can actually have, say, if I pick up a sword, the sword can appear on my back and then I can equip it from pulling it out from there. Um, that takes a little bit of fiddling around with that player model, but that's something that we'll add in at one stage. So I'm just going to do that, I'm just going to click apply. Um, so that's pretty much all we need for that one, but I will go down to the shooter section. Um, we need to go, yeah, components. So again, we can add on the, the lock on for the player shooter. Um, I'm going to leave that for now. I might add that in a little bit later on. Um, we can play around with it, see if it's a mechanic that we really want to have. But for now, I'm just going to leave um, most of the aiming up to the player um, in order to do. So yeah, I'm not really going to bother with it, using the lock on just at the moment. Um, one thing that I did want to change though, is I wanted to change the head track. I'm going to open that up. And uh, so set here, they've got a tick box here for follow camera. Um, I don't want it following the camera because you can see by follow camera it means that anywhere I look the head's going to turn around and see how it looks a little bit weird until it reaches a point where it can't go past and it will snap back to the centre. Um, I don't really like how that works uh, if I'm not aiming down the sights at something. If I'm just standing around, it might look cool if you're in multiplayer and you want to be able to see where the player's looking, that might help. But for single player it's just there's no point. So I'm going to actually turn that off. Um, and take off the follow camera now when you look um, at the footage we're always looking forward so we can just rotate the camera around the player and the player isn't affected um, we can move around he can still go through you can look down but his head's always going to be straight up so that's cool um, yeah so that's how we do that so that's that player ready to go now um, but what I want to do now is I want to actually change the color so we're going to change his jacket, we'll either go with a black or a purple and I might even dye his hair white because I'm a big fan of the Witcher. So we're going to have grey hair, maybe with um, some lighter colour streaks through it uh, and then maybe change some of the other colours too. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop the recording now and I'll jump into Photoshop and I will bring up the material and I'll show you how to do that. All right, welcome back. So uh, we're looking at editing the texture colors uh, of the player model now. Now, the way Cinti um, do their player models, or these, uh, at least these polygon ones, is they've got um, these texture packs where they have tiny little lines and that uh, pretty much affects the color that you have. So originally this one's set up with uh, Texture 01A, which is the guy with the red coat. Um, if you click on the male sorcerer, uh, so you go to the prefab, you click on the male sorcerer mesh, you'll see it'll come up with a material, and I'll say material 01A, and then you can change the um, albedo uh, here, which sets it up to, at the moment it's set on 3, so if we put it on 1, you can see that's our first character colour, um, and then you've got the other character colour, which is this one, 
and then of course I want to use the one, uh, this one because it's purple and he's already got the light hair set up um, and brown pants, looks pretty uh, cool but I want to change some of these colours. So in order to do that I need to open it up in Photoshop so I can pretty much just right click that there, um, show it in Explorer, find the file and then edit it in, uh, well I've got Photoshop but you can use GIMP, you can use whatever other um, edit you need. But just jumping to that now, so you can see we've brought up here, so this is texture 3A, this is actually the uh, the first texture that I had because I needed to figure out um, exactly what it was that was changing um, in order to affect those colours. And I found out it's actually um, these three colours here, so if you have a look down in the bottom left here you've got um, these colours set up uh, along here. Now we want them to change, so all of these colours here um, correspond to colours that are on our player model. Um, if you have a look, his jackets are purple and a yellow colour, so these colours here are the ones that are affecting his jacket. Um, so what I want to do is I want to actually change, uh, say, so make it a purple and black colour. Um, so I'm going to go here, I'm just going to get my eyedropper tool when I find it, there it is. Um, I want it to be as dark as I can, so I'm going to choose this colour here, because this is already on our colour palette, um, and you'll see the default colour palettes are, are up here. Um, but for now we've got this, so I'm going to change uh, that yellowy colour, so the inside of the jacket, to a dark colour. So I want that, I want that. And then it needs to be a little bit lighter in another section, so I'm actually going to go really light and get um, that lighter grey there. And we'll see how that turns out. One, two, three. Um, now before I go actually affecting that, I'm going to come back here, I'm actually going to get this, just so I've got a copy of it, um, and I don't modify it and have to, have to wreck it, I'm going to go Control D, which will duplicate it, it's going to go 3A1, so that's perfectly fine, we don't worry about him. Um, now I'm now going to come back here to um, this, I'm going to go File, Save, I'm just going to save right over the top of that, um, because now when I go back into here, it should actually change my character's um, uh, graphics. And I say should, but it doesn't look like it is, so I'm just going to make sure that, that is actually the one that's in there at the moment. Um, Alright, so it hasn't really changed anything, so that's not the part where I need to change. Okay, let's uh, let's try that one again. So, we've got that there, it might actually be these two colours here, the jackets, and it might actually just be these colours along here with the exception of the white for the inside. Um, and then maybe that. Um, Alright, give me one second, I'm just going to try this now. So, um, yep, I've got the, actually I've already got the lighter colour selected done, so I'm going to just put that in there. And then I'm going to select the darker colour. I'm going to get my paint bucket, and I'm going to fill that point there. I'm going to go File, Save, and now we should see a difference. Yes, good, so now we've got the grey jacket area, um, and I think the black in there also comes into play somewhere, but that looks kind of cool as it is. I like that jacket. Um, what am I a more of a stark purple? So maybe I'm going to go back into here and I'm going to have a look at what other colour purple I have. So if I scroll up a bit, yeah, you can see I've got um, yeah definitely a couple of different colours there for the purple. So there's more of a bluey purple. Um, let's have a little play around with that. Let's have a look. So I'm going to go that colour. Is that already the colour that's there? No, it's not. So I'm going to put that in there. Ooh. I'm going to turn that down. I'm actually going to put the tolerance level just down to 5 so that we only really colour in that block. That's fine. I'm going to derive that. Save. And when I go to bring this up, hopefully that's changed it. Uh, I don't really think it has, but let's have another try. We'll colour this one here as a purple. I'm going to go File, Save. And yeah, so now you can see it's a bit of a different colour purple. Um, I like that. That's my kind of purple for a sorcerer's outfit. Why not? Cool. Um, we can also change these belts to black. I'm actually going to leave them as brown. I kind of like that look. Um, the colours around there are also fine. Now the hair colour is the next one that we want to change. So we need to find out where the hair is uh, on our list. Let's have a look. So what colour really matches the hair? I suppose these two colours here are more of the hair colour. Um, if I open this back up. Yeah, it's like there's two levels there. Then you've got the grey. So let's try getting just a regular old grey through the hair. Um, we're going to go find our eyedropper again. Um, I'm going to go for this colour grey. Uh, it's a little bit darker, so that's all right. We'll give that a go, and we'll try that. I'm going to go save, and there we go. Now he's got grey hair that actually matches his jacket almost. So <laughs> that's fun. And of course, yeah, we didn't have to change that grey because it's a little bit lighter, so it looks like a little bit of streak, and it looks like he's got a bit of grey hair and uh, grey moustache. We can actually change the colour of the moustache, I think that's what that second um, 
colour our image was in that one there that we modified. Um, now the shirt. Uh, I don't know if I want really a plain white shirt, I think that looks a little bit poxy. Uh, I'm not really sure what colour I should make it, but let's just have a look um, at what colours we've got. Maybe a kind of green would offset the purple, um, maybe even a red, uh, probably not a red. But let's have a look at how green looks. Um, I'm going to pick this green here. Oh, green and purple, I don't know. But we'll try that. Uh, I'm going to go file save and we're going to see if that's edited it. No, oh, must be the wrong one. That's fine. And uh, we've got to put it here. Oops, file save. Ha. Okay. So that's not what we need to edit. Um, maybe. What could it be? Save. I can always go back through the history and um, edit these if I make a mistake. Okay, like, I don't even know what that shirt's made of, so we're just going to leave it as white for now. Um, you'll figure it out if you're if you got your own characters. Have take some time, play through with it, um, and figure out what it is that needs to change. I'm going to leave that book that colour because that's pretty cool. I can always turn it bright red or something else. Anyway, that's kind of cool for the um, the character that I want to make or the the character look anyway. Um, yeah, so let's just have a look at him. He looks pretty groovy. Uh, now, of course, when we play it, doo -doo -doo. here he is. Here's a little groovy Zamon character with his uh, different color style that we've changed. And he looks pretty cool. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Alright, so um, in the next part I'm actually going to show uh, how we're going to create a weapon for him, one that suits his uh, style, and then we're going to add that weapon into his uh, inventory to start with, and I'll, um, I'll show you how that works. Okay, so now let's uh, start having a look at um, uh, editing some of the items. I don't want to go into full depth because I'm actually going to make a whole video on um, how to set them up the way we need to set them up um, with all the extra stuff. But this is just for the demonstration purpose so we can see um, how the weapons work. Now the easiest way to do it is to actually use a, a, an existing weapon. Um, so I'm going to move that up. If we go to uh, in here, actually, even if it is, well, it should be in here, prefabs. Um, so we can go down here, um, so in the melee combat um, section of the template, go to weapons, and then you can see we've got see, uh, sword long, sword short. Uh, I'm going to go with a uh, sword long, and we'll pop that in there. So yeah, you can see that's about the, the size that we want to have. Um, pop that into the scene. Now, um, as I said before, you, normally if you just drag it into here, it'll come up zero, zero. Um, but we'll zero it out before we go changing anything. I just don't want it under the, the player's feet at the moment. Um, so down here you can see we've got the sword um, that will pop up um, in his hand uh, or at least as close in the hand until we actually um, figure out the default points but for now this is how it looks. Um, so you see you've got the model inside there inside a collider um, and then the yellow section there is the hitbox for that weapon. Now in order to modify this we've got sword v long, we've got components and then you can see hitbox and then the sword model itself. So we're going to leave that sword model there for now and we're going to actually pick a sword to go with from um, my art resources pack which I've got the 3D items mega pack. Go down to prefabs, we go through swords and we've got the one-handed sword. Um, even though it's a long sword you could put in the two-handed sword later on um, and just modify the size of it but for now we're just going to use this. Uh, I'm going to look for a cool purple one like one that I had highlighted before. That's probably a little too cool. <laughs> Let's tone it back a little bit. Uh, and find another purple one. Um, I like the look of this one here, it's got that curvy blade so that's a bit fancy. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to drag that into here so it actually becomes a child of the components section and as you can see it's uh, quite small there. So that's probably not going to work for our longsword. Um, we can uh, you know, try and adjust the scale of it by scaling it out a certain way. Um, can always scale it a little bit longer but as you can see it's going to make the handle a lot longer as well. Um, Bring it down to just maybe two. Uh, oh, I mean, we could get away with that. Let's um, let's actually hide that. So yeah, you can see it's still going to be a little bit of an issue, and it just looks a little bit silly. So all right, uh, we're not going to have that one then. I'm going to take that off, and we're going to actually switch that out with one of the two-handed swords. So we will go to the two-handed swords this time. So correction on that. That's fine. <laughs> um, oh, actually, that one looks. Pretty damn cool, but again, a little too cool. Let's, uh, oh god, they're all too cool. Um, where are we? 
Why do they make all the purple ones look super cool? Come on, just give me a, give me a regular looking sword that's two handed and purple. not going to work in my favour. So maybe we won't go with the purple, maybe we're just going to scroll down until we find. See this is a regular sword, it's blue. Yeah, I want a different colour than blue. That's kind of cool. Greens, alright I guess. And we'll go with grey. So we'll go with the standard grey. Okay cool. Now we've picked out the sword that we actually want to use, we're going to put it in there. So as you can see it's still um, quite stumpy, um, but we can start stretching this out and it looks a little bit better when we do that. Um, now we need to actually change as well where it sits, so we need to move it up just so that it's sort of in line with the base there and then the tip of that weapon. Um, and when we come here, yep, so that should be fine. Um, even so, we can actually move it down here anyway and then we'll just adjust the where the hitbox sits. So we can adjust the hitbox because this is going to be our collider again, so remember that that's the collider. Um, the main thing we want to do is when we click on here, um, uh, if we actually delete that long sword out now, so we want to delete that. When we click on here, we need to make sure that the pivot point, which is this, so when we click that, that's actually going to be um, where we want it to sit on the handle of the weapon. So we want it to sort of yeah be the the front hand there is actually going to be at the top end of that. Um, we can change that around by basically moving this. If we want it lower, we just move that up a little bit. And when we click here, you can see it's still remained in that position. Um, but of course, we'd need to move the hitbox up as well. But when we click on components, it's still going to be about central to the handle. Um, obviously, we want it to set up a little bit higher, so I am just going to control Z that and move that back. And now when we click it, yeah, it sits up a little bit higher. But that's where we want it to actually sit anyway, because um, yeah, the other hand will fall onto the, the bottom there. So that's cool. So that's the, the long sword. Um, I'm actually going to just go over the top of that previous sword. I'm just going to click apply. Um, oh, sorry, I was actually going to zero that out, wasn't I? So zero, 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 and then click apply. That way we know it's always going to spawn in the right spot. Just going to click um, delete for that one, because yeah, we don't need it in there now. Now we're coming into our player prefab, and we want to be able to have it equipped um, as soon as he starts the game. So we want to have our item manager here. Uh, we've already got that all set up, so we're just actually going to pick that item. We're going to go look for V long sword, or V sword long, I think it was. Okay, so it's actually called V Greatsword in the items list. Um, so that's a little bit of a discrepancy there. So we go Greatsword, we go Add. Um, I'm just going to change the attributes now. We don't have to. That's fine. Uh, when we open it up here, so you can see this is the item, uh, the items list. So these are all the different um, items that they've got. So the Greatsword's the long one, and when you click on here, you'll see it says Sword V Long is the original object. So that's it. Just different naming there for that, but that's still the same item. Um, we're going to leave everything else as it is for now. We're not going to change all this until we start getting into the actual changes um, that we need to make when we're making our items. So we'll leave that. Uh, we can set here auto equip. If we tick that box, it will automatically appear in um, in his hand when you start the game. So it will automatically be equipped in the, the equipment slot. Um, you can choose which place it's equipped to. So if you've got a shield, you'd want that set to one because one is the left hand, zero is the right hand. Um, and I think two is like something else for some sort of crazy thing, but I think you can alter the way that works. Anyway, we just have one of them um, and we're ready to go. So if we click play now, you'll see he starts with it in his hand. Now it's obviously just not set up um, quite correctly because it's uh, going off the default point that was set up in the new um, when we first put on the thing, but that needs to be altered. Um, one thing I want to do is we're just going to take off the maximize play. So we're going to click play, then we're going to go to play again, and now it's going to open in the smaller screen, which is fine. Um, so now we need it to actually move down to the right position we need. In order to do that, we need to click to the scene view. If we click on, uh, oh, actually we're going to have to move him away from that screen because that's going to play up. Click on the scene view, um, find our character. So to find the character, you just go to this part here, do not destroy and load. Go to this instance, uh, we're looking at him, he's got all this stuff. I'm going to click on the sword. And as you can see, it's now in the hierarchy, selected the sword. Now we need to modify it by the default equip point. So what we're actually going to do there is we're going to move that until it matches. I'm just going to pause this because it makes it easier to try and grab it than when he's moving and then um, you're constantly moving with it, which doesn't help. So now just actually going to move that default equip point into position. So we've got that. Uh, so obviously it looks all right there, but when you bring it here, it's not quite right. Put it on this way, uh, it's a little bit better. Um, could still be rotated a little bit, so I'm actually going to rotate that forward. 
So again, we're just putting that point in 3D space relative to the hand that it's attached to. Because as you can see, it's the um, child of the hand right, or the right hand, should I say. Um, so we want to make sure that it's sort of aligned like that. Um, as you can see, it sort of runs along his arm. It's also angled the right way. You can always tilt it um, or rotate it in a certain way. That looks pretty good. So now that I've got that, I'm actually going to go here. I'm going to go Copy Component. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn that off. Uh, we're going to go back up to the prefab here and we are going to <coughs> excuse me, come to our item manager. I'm going to click on open equip points and we're going to go down here. We're actually going to add a custom handle. So you've got the default equip point and that's the default point for everything to join up to. But of course not all your items end up having the same pivot point. So if you've got five items that go to the default equip point, they might not all sit in the hand properly because of the way the items are different. So this is where custom handles comes in handy because you can actually create um, handles in a section, um, or sorry, equipment points in a section for each of the different weapons you have so that you can align them up and that they all work properly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna add a custom handler. Um, so you click on custom handles, you go to new handler, um, it will create a, um, a game object in the right hand bone and you need to give it a name. So this one here, I'm going to go um, Great Sword Equip. Um, before I go clicking Create, I'm going to highlight that. I'm just going to Control C it because I'll need that for a, a little bit later. So Great Sword Equip. I'm going to click Create, and now you can see when we look down here, here it is. Here's the Great Sword Equip point. Um, same as it is there, uh, the default Great Sword Equip. Now I'm going to go to the Transform of that Great Sword Equip. Oh, you know what I've just done? I've done something very silly. Well, maybe I haven't. Hmm, that looked like it actually worked. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so now I've pasted the um, the component values. So those those values that I copied off the default equip point when I was playing the game, when I saw that the sword was in the right spot, I've now passed those by pasting component values. I've passed them onto great sword equip point. So now what I need to do is I need to go back into the prefab and I can have a look here. There is an easier way to do it for the thing, but for now we'll just do it this way. Um, I'm going to click on the greatsword. It's going to open up my item attributes. Now we need to have a look at the, the greatsword. So we navigate in our list here. We've got the greatsword. Click on it. It brings up all the details of that sword. Um, and in custom settings, it's got here the custom equip point. So we want to change that to greatsword equip. So that's why I, co I, I um, copied that section so that I've got it written exactly as it's written in the, um, the item manager. So now what it knows um, by, by doing that, it knows now that every time a greatsword is equipped, it needs to go to this equip point, which is greatsword equip, which in our hierarchy over here is this point here. Rather than the default equip point, it's going to go to the greatsword equip point, which is great. No, no pun intended. Now when we click play, it will automatically equip and it's in the same position that we left it in before. It's going to maximize that. And there you go. So now it's in the area where we wanted it. So now our character has a nice sword. We can switch to the sword thing. So I might need to still sort of modify the way that works. I might even have to have a look at the animation itself. Um, but that's his block animation. We can run around. We can swing the sword. And there's, yeah, no problems with swinging it. It seems to work fine. Aim, can change the way it cuts. There you go. So now we've got our sword that uh, that works in the game, and our guy can run around with it and chop things. No, we don't have anything to chop yet. So anyway, that's all I'm going to go with this one. I've already hit uh, pretty much an hour for this video, so um, yeah, it might get a little bit uh, dragging on. In the next one, we're going to have a look a little bit more about building up this test scene. Um, oh, actually, one thing I will show. So this is actually, a, a, the, as I was saying earlier, this is going to be the test scene where I can um, throw in bits and pieces and just test to make sure that they actually work in the game um, before I go uh, like you know, implementing them into any kind of special scene that, um, that might cause issues, things like that. Um, so what I've done is I've actually saved scene um, and I've gone I'll do it here, save scene as, I've just called it test. Um, you can call it test scene, you can call it demonstration, you can call it just working build, whatever you want to call it. But I save the scene usually as test so that I know that this is my test scene. that will have a character and everything set up in it, ready to go. And if I need to test something out, I can just add it into this scene. Um, so yeah, so that's how we do that one there. Uh, yeah, again, so in the next video, I'll go on a little bit more about creating um, some of the items and some of the structures around to play with, just so we can start testing out some of those mechanics in this scene. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you again next time.